once upon a time might have taught you that a great engaging way to start an essay is with a definition. You may have even written something like, Merriam-Webster defines leadership as, or World War II was a global conflict from 1939 to 1945. And so probably in the course of your writing career, you have figured out that in fact, it's a little bit cliche to begin with a definition and it's not all that engaging. There's nothing about a definition that makes a reader want to dig in and keep reading. But definitions in our writing are still important. Our reader still needs to have terms and events and people defined for them. And definitions can actually serve a very different but important function in our structure. They can help us bridge from the introduction of our writing to the body of our writing. This is what we're going to look at today in all kinds of writing genres. Today's writing move is the definition hinge structure. Let's take a look at what the definition hinge structure is. So just like what it sounds like, the definition hinge structure is where the definition paragraph, that group of definitions that you are maybe tempted to put at the beginning of your paper, actually happens a little bit later. And it serves as a hinge from the intro or the lead of your writing to the body of your writing. This is really helpful for us writers because sometimes it's hard to figure out gosh, how am I going to get from this kind of catchy opening into the meat of my writing, into the part that I really want to say? Giving some important definitions can help slow things down for a minute, change the tone, and help us move from introduction to body. Let's take a look at one of these definition paragraphs in a mentor text. This is from a piece about wild horses from Outside Magazine. Chincoteague, which has an average elevation of about 21 inches, is protected from the open ocean by Assateague, a 37-mile-long barrier island that spans the Maryland-Virginia line. Unlike Chincoteague's 3,000-person urban center, which is also called Chincoteague and is known for hotels, vintage beach house rentals, ice cream shops, and seafood restaurants, Assateague is feral, an undeveloped mix of windswept terrain, all of it protected as parkland in one form or another, mostly by the federal government. It's on Assateague where you'll find the local celebrities, a fabled herd of wild salt grass eating ponies. Now, Tim Neville has written a great paragraph here. This is beautiful writing and there is so much that we could say about it. It's giving us definitions, right? What is Chincoteague? What is Assateague? And how are these two places different? It's defining what these places are and what they are known for. But he didn't begin his piece of writing with this definition paragraph, right? This might not have been the most engaging way to get readers to want to keep finding out this particular story about a particular wild salt grass eating pony in this particular context. So he saves these definitions for later. He starts out with a little bit of a story. He drops us into a scene. Then he defines his terms. What is Chincoteague? What is Assateague? Where are we? How are these two places different? And then he moves into the body of his writing. Let's take a look at a different mentor text to see what other kinds of definitions we might be giving in these hinge paragraphs. This is a piece from Smithsonian Magazine about ship wreckage that is really, really popular for scuba diving. But Sean Kingsley wants to dig into the history of that ship. So again, much like Tim Neville in Outside Magazine, he begins by painting a scene, by dropping us into the ship, by describing it, by describing its kind of wild past. And then he defines it for us. What was the Kuka, which is the ship he's writing about? Well, it was originally called the A. Stewart. The Kuka was built in 1889 as a barge for hauling timber. According to a paper by local historian Richard Wiles, the Wolverine Steamship Company bought the boat in 1928. Gallagher saw his new acquisition as a chance to cash in on prohibition. On New Year's Eve 1929, the Kuka held its grand opening as a floating dance hall as it advertised itself. Fuller's Orchestra provided the music and couples paid $1.50 for entry. 
So we're getting the definition of this ship. When was it built? Who built it? What was its function? And we're getting this kind of in the middle of the essay. It's not coming at the very beginning. We're getting absorbed into this scene first. Then we get this definition paragraph. And then Sean Kingsley moves into the body of his writing about how this was an important moment and an important fixture in Prohibition. But wait, there's more. Here's another one from Michelle Ruiz from the New York Times. She's writing about the two French dietitians who came up with the concept of intuitive eating in the 1970s. She describes a dinner party first, and then we get this paragraph where she defines intuitive eating as conceived by the dietitian nutritionist duo is the practice of renouncing restrictive diets and the goal of weight loss and encouraging people to tune into the intuition that governed their eating as toddlers. This includes, and then it gives some of the key concepts in intuitive eating. And then Michelle Ruiz moves back into the body of her piece, which is about how intuitive eating has changed diet culture. So we've got this kind of health writing. We've got some historical writing. We have some narrative essay with the outside magazine piece. We could even see this in writing about economics. So this one is defining the Robinson Crusoe economy, which is an economic model that is sometimes taught about single commodity economies using the concept of coconuts. So the beginning of this piece by Hajun Chang begins with describing all the various things coconuts can do, why coconuts are such a valuable commodity. Then we get this definition. What is the Robinson Crusoe economy anyway? Why are we talking about it? What is it? And then he moves into the body of his piece, which is debunking the Robinson Crusoe economy of coconuts. Here's what's important. Yes, these are great definition paragraphs. And you can go back and you can pause this video and you can look at each one more closely for how they're written, how they're structured, the kind of word choice that writers use when they are giving definitions in this way. But if we are using this to help structure our writing, which is to organize our writing, the most important part is really where it sits within the piece. So here you can see, I have screenshots of the four articles that you just saw mentor texts from today. This is the order that you saw them in. And I have highlighted those definition hinge paragraphs. What do you notice? What I notice is that regardless of the overall length of the piece of writing, those definition hinges kind of sit at the exact same spot, right? We have a handful of paragraphs before it, which are giving that engaging lead, that kind of lead or introduction that actually is going to make a reader want to read more. Then right before we get into the body of the piece, the main idea that the writer wants to communicate, it's like the writer takes a deep breath and slows things down for a second and gives some important definitions that the reader is going to need to know to make sense of the rest of the piece. And that's the hinge, right? That's where we turn from introduction to body by these little paragraphs that give us important definitions throughout. So where in your writing are you having trouble transitioning from the intro to the body and maybe finding a few definitions that your readers really need and settling those as a hinge point in between could help you make that transition? Have you started your piece of writing with a definition and now you're feeling kind of self-conscious about it? <laughs> maybe try moving it to after a new introduction, using it as a hinge to get into the body of your writing and see how that sounds. See if it works better for you. Where does your reader need some really important context, some really important definitions? And placing them at that hinge point can kind of kill two birds with one stone for you. It can give the reader the information they need, and it can give you the structure that you're looking for in your writing. Thanks so much for watching Mini Moves for Writers. We hope that you're liking and subscribing to our channel so that you don't miss any future moves.